The True First Thanksgiving Everyone knows of the first Thanksgiving between the pilgrims and Native Americans in 1621, but there was a prior one before that, held by a rogue group of pilgrims that were expelled from the rest of the colony at almost the onset of their arrival to the New World. The group consisted of four families that were found to be worshiping a pagan god instead of the rest of the colony's Puritan beliefs. The colony elders decided to show them mercy instead of burning them at the stake as heretics or witches and banished them to the deepest part of the forest. The Smiths, the Hartfords, the Sanfords, and the Bartholomews were the names of the families banished, and they found refuge in a compound they built for themselves deep in the Massachusetts woods. Nestled between a river and rock formation, later known as Tombstone Rock, for the many tombstone-shaped structures within its formation. Rumors began to swirl not long after the establishment of the outcast compound of abductions of children from the village, along with household pets and livestock from the farms. Some villagers believe the families from the compound were responsible for all the disappearances, but there was no proof of any wrongdoing. The village elders would not act without proof, and that's exactly what happened soon after. A wee village girl named Sarah was walking through the woods against her parents' orders and reported hearing blood-curdling screaming. She ran as fast as she could back to the village and told her parents what she heard, who then told the town elders. They scolded the young girl for going near the compound, reminding her no one goes out there, not even the tribes people from the Native American villages venture near that compound. They listened to Sarah's story and were quite shocked and decided to form a party led by the magistrate and search the compound the next day. The party came up on the compound around midday in the afternoon, and they were greeted with a plume of smoke emanating from the chimneys of the cabins and the smell of cooking meat. It, however, did not smell of the familiar chicken or cow being cooked. This smelled peculiar. The men gripped their muskets and opened the front gate to the compound. There was no signs of anyone moving about, so they headed to the main hall where the compound held their feasts. The men heard voices from inside, sounding like a celebration. They then kicked in the doors and were left stunned beyond belief. Before them sat the families of the compound, feasting on the missing. Everyone and everything smeared in blood, giving thanks to their pagan lord. I love my family. I used to have to repeat, I love my family, to myself over and over, just to make it through the holidays. They were never physically abusive or anything. No one ever laid hands on each other. It was more words than anything else. I loved my family. Dinner would start off well enough. Everyone would be seated, and we would toast to the holiday. My cousins would sit for all of five minutes before screaming and flying from their seats to run around the table. They would grab their obnoxiously loud toys and smash against cabinets or our chairs. My aunt would watch and sigh, Boys will be boys. I love my family. Soon after, my uncle would loudly spout his political views, drunkenly spewing hateful words about homosexuality and those liberal snowflakes, while my sister and her girlfriend sat across from him. I love my family. He, of course, would make sure to say no offense after every quip. Their eyes would narrow but neither my sister or her girlfriend would speak out against him. No, they instead would make passive-aggressive comments about my aunt's family, 
Most times, in their frustration, my sister and her girlfriend would turn on me, asking invasive and pointed questions about my life and future. They would make me feel as if every decision I ever made or will make is not up to their standard. I love my family. My mother would spend the day preparing the house for guests and slaving away in the kitchen, her words. She would guilt anyone in the vicinity into trying to help, then martyr herself claiming she always had to do this alone. She would sit at the table and eye anyone who did not properly appreciate her work. Huffing and puffing, if anyone dared to put salt on something or too much gravy on her overcooked turkey. I love my family. My brother would sit heavily, pulling out his latest handheld game. He never cared that it was time for family, a time to give thanks for all you had. With the volume turned up annoyingly loud, he used to grunt and shovel forkfuls of food into his pimpled face. It would be different this year. I insisted on helping my mother set the table. I collected everyone's drink order and made sure to completely dissolve a special, odorless ingredient in each glass before placing it in its proper spot. Everyone is seated now. I feel a rush of exhilaration at the thought of a peaceful and quiet dinner. I raise my glass. The others follow suit. Happy Thanksgiving! I love my family. A holiday to remember. Holidays are a special time of year to spend with family and friends, especially Thanksgiving, when you can eat until you explode and still have enough leftovers to last you a week. Nathan always got up early on Thanksgiving morning so he could get ready and head over to his parents' house. As Nathan pulled up to his parents' house, he could already smell the turkey filling the air. He already knew this was going to be a Thanksgiving to remember. He didn't even bother knocking or ringing the doorbell. He just walked right in and shouted, Happy Thanksgiving! Unfortunately, the enthusiasm wasn't mutual, but instead was greeted with a hello from his parents and his older sister Ellie, who were already sitting at the dining room table. Is everything okay? Nathan asked worriedly. We're fine. Now sit down before the meal gets cold, said his mother. You already cooked? Set the table and got everything ready? It's not even noon, yelled Nathan. This bothered Nathan a lot, since his family has never done this or even been this prepared for Thanksgiving in the 29 years he's enjoyed Thanksgiving with his family. He took his spot and looked around at each member of his family, waiting for them to say grace or to say anything at all. Instead, his parents began piling food on their plate while his sister played with her silverware. Why are you guys acting so weird? Did I do something wrong? Mom? Dad? Ellie? Nathan questioned them, but they didn't seem to care. Okay, fine. I'm going to call Rachel and go eat somewhere else with her. I'm sure her family at least acknowledges her instead of shutting me out on one of the happiest days of the year. Nathan set his napkin on the table next to his empty plate and picked up his phone to call his girlfriend. Hey, babe, my family is being weird and acting like jerks. Is it cool if... What? What do you mean, why am I calling you? I'm not at your parents' lake house. I'm at my parents' for Thanksgiving. How can you be looking at me and my family right now if I'm miles away eating with them? Yeah. Yeah. Put my sister on then and let me speak to her. Nathan laughed at the stupid prank his girlfriend was trying to pull on him. He had also noticed that his family was no longer eating. Nathan? 
How are you calling me from mom and dad's if you're here? Nathan. Nathan. Nathan slowly hung up the phone and put it in his pocket. I... I have to go. That was my neighbor, and he said there's something wrong with my house, so I better go check on that. I'll call you late. Nathan ran for the door, but it wouldn't open. He turned around and slumped down to his knees. What he thought was his family were standing over him. Family Road Trip It was two days before Thanksgiving, and Danny was fulfilling his annual duty of driving his parents to his sister's house just outside Spokane, Washington. He dreaded the six-hour trek every year and his parents' constant backseat driving. It seemed at least one thing had to go wrong on every road trip, and it just so happened that the first mistake on this trip was Danny taking a wrong turn, which sent them down a long, deserted, two-lane road with nothing but thick, ominous forests on either side. Since the family didn't know how long it would be until they got back on the main road, they made a unanimous decision to stop at a lone rest area to use the restrooms. As they got out of the car and stretched their legs, Danny looked over to see the only other vehicle at the rest stop, a large pickup truck that was parked a few spaces down with a burly bearded man sitting in the driver's seat. After Danny had finished his business in the restroom, he walked back out to where he had parked. His parents seemed to be taking their time, so he decided to look around, while at the same time distract himself from the overwhelming sense of dread the mysterious stranger in the large pickup truck was causing him. Before he knew it, he heard his car door slam shut and turned around to see his parents waiting for him. With everyone ready to go, Danny started off down the long stretch of road as darkness consumed everything around them. That was, until two bright lights came blasting up behind him. It was the truck from the rest stop, flashing his high beams and honking his horn as if it were the end of days. Danny found it strange that his parents remained calm and quiet despite the nerve-wracking situation. He rolled his window down and motioned for him to pass, but the monstrous truck continued with its harassment. Finally, Danny pulled over, got out, and started yelling at the truck driver who had pulled over behind him. The bearded man exited his truck in a hurry and ran towards Danny. Almost out of breath, the heavyset man grabbed Danny by the shoulders and a distressed voice said, Those people! They got in your car. They, they weren't the same as the ones who went into the restrooms. I saw them come from the woods. Before Danny could even comprehend what this man was trying to say, he heard his car doors open, followed by the sounds of footsteps rapidly retreating back into the dark forest that surrounded them. The last Thanksgiving. I sat down at the table. My family was saying a blessing. Boring. We dig into the turkey. I'm eating my food and trying to enjoy myself. I've never cared much for these people. But hey, it's tradition. I continue to eat when my niece, Ava, one of the few I actually like, whispers something to me. You need to save me some ham, she said in her cute little soft voice. I hate her dad, but I'll be damned if she isn't the most adorable thing. Of course, sweetie, I exclaimed. I look for the ham, but can't find it on the table. I go to look in the kitchen and can't find any. I return to the dining room to take my seat, to find my asshole brother, his wife, and my niece gone. Where'd Jack and Claire go? I asked. My aunt answered. Oh, they had to leave. They've got another meal to get to before the day's out. Damn it! 
Now I'm really stuck with them. I eat as fast as I can, help clean up and leave as quietly as I can. I pull up into my driveway and unlock my door. Another holiday down. Won't have to deal with that for a while. I go to my living room, switch on the TV, and fall asleep on my couch. Bob, shifting for a moment from our Black Friday coverage, I'm currently on the side of a crime scene on Belmont Street. I resist my grogginess and try to force my eyes open. Where do I know that name from? Where it appears two parents cannibalized their own daughter yesterday. Police are on site investigating. Oh no! That son of a bitch! He couldn't have! How could they do this? A chill comes over me. I am consumed in sweat and can't breathe when I realize you need to save me from them is what she said. The main chorus. The air feels cold on my bare skin. My head feels light, too light, as if it's completely gone. Hands I cannot see pull me from the cold. I try to open my eyes, but I cannot feel anything above my neck. I try to cry, but no sound comes out. Cool water runs over my body. I ache as it penetrates my frozen skin. Soft paper is pressed into me, drying me. I'm being moved again. The same hands scrub something into my skin. It stings. I'm so disoriented. Are we doing stuffing this year? A voice overhead asks. No, Mommy. I hate stuffing. A child's voice? A soft chuckle. Okay, no stuffing. The female voice hums. Minutes pass, hours maybe. I'm fading in and out of consciousness. Suddenly, coarse, sturdy hands yank me up. These hands feel familiar. I think they're the ones that brought me to this place. My arms are twisted painfully behind my back, crossing my limbs under the wings of my shoulder blades. I feel rough twine twisted around my wrists. My legs are given the same treatment, twisted roughly under me and secured with more twine. What is happening? Only a week ago I was out in the cold sunshine, enjoying a crisp November day. I'm rolled onto my back again. The same rough hands work with the softer pair to move me to some sort of metal container. There's a liquid at the bottom. Something floats in it. I can feel pieces of it bump against me. A light brush traces some type of oil or slick liquid over my skin. It is almost soothing. I feel like I should be panicking. Something is very wrong, but I am so tired and the brush feels so soft. The warmth of the room is finally sinking through my skin. Another great lurch, and I think I'm being carried. Be careful, said the female voice. Well, it is a bit heavier, dear, a gruff manly voice spat out. I'm not the one who chose it, she chided. They pushed me and the metal bath into something very warm, Hot, actually. My skin feels like it's blistering. Suddenly, there's a sharp pain in my side. Something is being pushed into my stomach. I whimper. I can feel my face again. I use all my might to pry open an eye and look down. It's a meat thermometer. I look up. My reflection stares back at me in horror. I'm in an oven. My hair is being hacked off. But I know it's me. I try to pull free of the twine, cutting painfully into my wrists. I think she's fighting the sedative. <laughs> I can feel the prick of a needle and neck. My head grows light again. I'm fading. Can't have her ruin the main course now, can we? The man chuckles. A child's giggle is all I hear. Before the darkness and heat. Take me. 
social escort. Summer wasn't her real name. Ladies plying her trade never used their real names. A wholesome girl next door with a kinky streak was how her profile described her. A gallery of subtle airbrush pictures of the fresh-faced 20-year-old university girl at the top of the page contrasted amusingly with a set of more lascivious photographs accompanied by a laundry list of perversities she was prepared to endure located near the bottom of her portfolio just above her contact details just the sort of girl to bring home for thanksgiving she was initially hesitant to take up my offer to be my companion for thanksgiving dinner but predictably avarice prevailed the amount of money stuffed into the envelope i handed her could have covered her tuition for an entire semester never mind her living expenses but what is money compared to the joy and satisfaction of seeing your collected family doting and fawning all over the golden-haired all-american sweetheart that now graced the table for each story fanciful or not she told of her carefree upbringing or her scholastic and athletic successes my family seemed to have a dozen questions lined up instead of sullenly shoveling the contents of our plates into our mouths like previous thanksgivings the house now roared with conversation and merriment for once there would be no reproachful glares and titters to dog me for the rest of the year no more grumbles from father about how she wasn't good enough for this family or some meandering lecture from mother about how i could do so much better no more piteous attempts at consolation by my aunt with that tired old adage about there being always more fish in the ocean even my gang of younger cousins who'd usually call a temporary truce to their incessant bickering in order to make better sport of me over the thanksgiving period now held me in awe and sought my approval at every turn summer wasn't her real name and neither was the persona she cloaked herself in but my family did not know that i'd long suspected the blood of the coven along with its arcane powers linking flesh and memory had run thin within our line every time one of my parents or relatives took a moment in between greasy mouthfuls to look up at me and remark how wholesome and sweet this one tasted only added credence to my theory like the others i'd brought home for thanksgiving they're all the same once you crack open the sternum slit open the belly and disgorge its contents onto the dinner table like we had done with summer yet i couldn't help but think to myself that perhaps joy and happiness even if built upon a foundation of lies and murder were still virtuous emotions and thus worthy of thanks who knows past the gravy thanksgiving driving every year millions of people hit the roads to visit family in time for thanksgiving every year i am one of those millions it's not too bad if you're driving through the night the only people you'll see on the trip are truckers and people racing just as fast as you are to get to their families my family they live a good eight hours up the coast depending on if i run into anything last year was a wreck some asshole tried to cut me off going 100 miles an hour on a two-lane highway no way he was surviving that one guy crashed and cooked inside of his car what a waste of life this year i started my drive around seven at night so i would arrive around three in the morning daylight savings had gotten it to be darker earlier 
and the sun would be rising just a couple of hours after I arrived. Most of my drive was through unpopulated woods, and every once in a while, a heavy mist would come out from the marshland. It was during one of these heavy mists, at around two in the morning, that I noticed two very bright lights headed in my direction. They couldn't see me through the mist because my headlights were turned off. When they were passing me, I swiped the side of their car, causing them to careen into the trees. The car crashed, short and simple. Nothing poetic about it. It was a family, too. A dad and his two children. The youngest was in her car seat crying. I unbuckled her and brought her into my car. I left the father in front. If the cops find a driver, then they won't be immediately suspicious. Last year, my family was upset. I didn't bring anything alive to drink. This year, we will all get drunk after sunset. I turned my headlights on for the first time of my drive. I would still make it before sunrise. A Thanksgiving Nightmare I'm at a gun range. The shooters are lined up behind the firing line. The range instructor demonstrates where to aim for the most effective kill shot, pointing at the target. I realize the target is me, and I'm facing the shooters. They aren't human, but large birds instead. Their eyes are fierce. Their waddles a vengeful red. My eyes dart around confused, the only part of my body able to move. The instructor spouts off a command before raising a feathered wing. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the wing come swiftly down in an executing motion. The guns fire. I wake up. Interesting, said Doc, the back of his chair facing me. Please continue. There's a lot of noise, a mixture of worried machines and panicked voices. The air is thick and stuffy, tainted with death. My family is there. I'm relieved, but not for long. Now we're moving on a mechanical belt. We try to make a run for it, but our feet are quickly subdued. We're suddenly jerked upright, hanging upside down from our shackles. A brief pause and we're moving again. I hear an abrupt but short scream let out beside me, followed by heavy dripping, like water pouring on the ground. Another scream, but closer, accompanied with that same pouring sound. Another scream, and my heart seizes. The scream is my own. I gurgle as my mouth fills with warm blood. I gasp as more escapes from my throat. I wake up. Yes, very curious, Doc contemplated. And you think this is all suppressed guilt from your slaughterhouse days, manifesting into nightmare form? Unfortunately, yes, but I won't bore you with the next one. Surely I don't have to tell you how watching the cooking network, where the chef is a maniacal turkey and you're the one being roasted, can seriously mess with your head do i no certainly not besides that's all the time we have for today anyway doc concluded i think you've made a real breakthrough though he reassured but what i'm curious about is how you can still live with yourself he inquired as his chair slowly began to turn around beg pardon my hands unconsciously clenching the armrests of my leather chair. You know, we don't really care too much for Thanksgiving, Doc explained. It's never really been considered a holiday for us. And we certainly can't blame everyone. His chair began to creak. But we can blame someone. I closed my eyes for just a second and began my breathing exercises Doc and I worked on in an earlier session. When I opened them, the chair was completely turned around and facing me. 
but it was empty. Had I imagined it all? Was this a nightmare too? Just as I felt myself relaxing, I sensed a looming presence behind me, a ragged breath on the back of my neck, a faint rustling of feathers. <laughs> I never woke up again. My favorite holiday story. The diner I worked at once offered the Thanksgiving experience. It included a heaping plate of mashed potatoes, peas, and turkey, paired with a pumpkin pie and as much bread as they could eat. I say once, because nobody goes out to eat on Thanksgiving, and everyone's sick of turkey for about a week, so most of it went to waste. But this is a story of when we still offered it. It was about five o'clock, and the diner was empty. Everyone else had gone home, leaving me as the waiter, the busboy, and the chef, which I was just fine with. I had no family at the time to eat with and could rake in overtime pay while reading my books. But then I see him, a grimy, homeless man, pressed against the glass to the point his scraggly beard fanned out around him like the fur of a mangy dog. I would have ignored him. I should have ignored him. But I was probably going to throw out the meal anyway, so I let him in and gave him our Thanksgiving experience on the house. He wept with joy. He did. He shook with every bite and thanked me repeatedly. The moment the food hit his stomach, his face contorted in confusion. That's how foreign the sensation was of being full. Never before had I seen someone appreciate my food. He told me he hadn't eaten for an entire month and that the meal I'd prepared was the most delicious thing he'd ever eaten in his life. This was a story I came to tell my children and their children on each Thanksgiving holiday. Struggle is good for the soul. If a doctor tells you your child has only a one in a thousand chance of survival and then they survive, that happiness must be beyond even my comprehension. Your favorite food might even bring you to tears after being starved for a month. Speaking of which, it's almost time to let my family out of the basement. They're in for a real treat tomorrow. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at duchessofdark and two. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness, your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.